I uh, want to thank everybody for coming today. I see a lot of family, friends, old neighbors, and all kinds of stuff here. So I, I appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, my name is Mark Rambo. I'm the president of the Sturgis Mead County Historical Society. Um, I'm also a board member for the Bearview Creek Historic Preservation Council, which most of you haven't heard of, but we're doing a lot of cool stuff out in the Soap Suds Row area. Um, and then on the board for Fort Meade Museum as well. So when they were looking for another program, I stupidly said, hey, I wrote a paper years ago. <laughs> so it ended up being today's program. The topic we're going to be discussing today is specifically the POWs that were taken prisoner at Kasserine Pass that were part of the Sturgis unit from the 109th Engineers. Um, and it's something that, like I said, I did a college paper on years ago and generously opened my mouth and said I had done it. And people, uh, we, we decided we needed a, a program about it. So. Uh, for you, the war is over. This was spoken by a German officer on February uh, 1943 at the Battle of Kasserine Pass. It was a uh, term that they had been taught to say to the American soldiers, um, but it was, it was said to a lot of them that were scattered in small groups as, as they became prisoners of war. Several members of the 109th Engineer Battalion of the South Dakota National Guard were taken prisoner of war by the German army during the Battle of Kasserine Pass. Uh, their survival for over two years, about two and a half years, some of them, um, in, in captivity is an amazing story, and we'll be going through that. But it's, it's through all the people who were prisoners of war other people that were in the same camp or other camps that I was able to put all this information together. It's through their memoirs, their discussions with family members, that kind of thing, that, that we're able to understand what happened at this point. So where this began? This is my grand uncle, Bill Caton. I see a lot of other relatives here that are some of the Deerings and the Lindstroms and uh, more of the Rambos and everything. We're all related to Bill Caton, who was a sergeant with the, well, at the time it was Company F of the 109th Engineers. Um, Uncle Bill was a great storyteller and had an amazing sense of humor. He liked spin yarns, too. And when you're talking to him, you're never too sure, you know, what experiences he was giving, uh, whether they were embellished or not, I never knew. I never knew. I just loved hearing his stories. Uh, he spoke about a variety of things, and uh, one of them was his attempted escapes while he was a prisoner of war. He talked about all of his attempted escapes and being taken again and put back in, in one of the Stalags and stuff. Um, this is Uncle Bill uh, years later in 1981 at a Fourth of July picnic one of the big family gatherings at my grandmother's house, and actually that's me listening to his tales um, when I was in high school. So it did, it did have a huge effect. And uh, like I said, you know, you were never too sure uh, if he was going under the premise that, well, I know Ross Lamphere likes this premise, that never let truth stand in the way of a good story. So... Um, that's, that's kind of what got me started then on this. Um, years later, after this, of course, I, I needed a paper to write an independent study for a, my history degree down at USD. And I decided to dig further into his stories and see what, you know, I knew there was kernels of truth there, but I wasn't too sure how far it went. So I decided to dig into it. As it progressed, I started noticing that, you know, with this group of people that were all taken from the Sturgis community, and we'll get into the list of everybody, um, there, there were other resources and other stories to tell. So it became more than just Uncle Bill's story. It became a story of the whole community and the whole unit, the 109th Engineers, Company F, later Company C, um, and, and what their experiences were as well. Um, In researching this, uh, my initial sources were mostly family 
memoirs, photographs, that kind of thing. And that's why you'll see a lot of things relative to Bill Caton's experience. But we also have uh, people that I've, I've managed to reach out to you know, that are descendants of some of the other prisoners, too. And you'll be hearing from them as well. But I want to thank a lot of people who helped with this process. First of all, Dr. John Schaff, a professor of political science at uh, Northern State University. I reached out to him recently. Uh, the uh, Center for Public History and Civic Engagement there had done interviews in the 70s and 80s with lots of National Guardsmen from around, oral, oral histories, and they were then transcribed. I wasn't sure if they'd still have them on record, but I reached out to him, and he and the head librarian and their work study people and everybody just scrambled and they found me a whole bunch of interviews with 109th engineer um, members, you know, years later. And a couple of them were the POWs, so it, it was highly helpful. Um, secondly, I want to thank Lee Allen Hilton McCartney. Uh, she is a local. The Hiltons were neighbors of ours out in Murray Edition back in the 70s. And she did some of these interviews with the 109th engineers. She's the one, while at Northern State, that, that did the oral histories with some several of them. Uh, I want to thank Bev Rosenboom. Where'd Bev go? Oh, there she is. Bev's father uh, was a prisoner of war with this group. He was not originally from Sturgis or South Dakota. Uh, Iowa, is that right? Yep, from Iowa, but he became really fast friends with all the Sturgis guys and spent his time with mostly with them in the POW camp, and you'll be hearing more about him as we go through. But she shared her dad's memories, uh, the book he had written, of his memoirs, everything. It was, it was again, very helpful. Duke Daring, who has... Um, Duke Doring, I was looking at the Deerings when I said that. Duke Doring, um, who has uh, researched this for years, and there's a lot of newspaper articles out there about him, and uh, if, if somebody passed away that was part of this group, he would do a, a story on them and stuff. So his, his, help, his research that he had done previously is, is again, very helpful. Uh, Tina Anderson Zimmerman. A daughter of Swede Anderson, who helped out. Can you hear okay, Mabel? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Francis Murray Flaherty and Colleen Murray Lewis, uh, daughters of Francis Murray and their memories. Um, some of them shared family letters and all kinds of things. So it, it was really helpful. Um, most importantly, there is one person that I want to thank that I've never met or never talked to. And they were, somewhere here. but they were probably the most valuable resource I found. And that gentleman's name is Angelo Spinelli. And he wrote this book that I was Googling 109th Engineers and Stalag 3B and all kinds of stuff back in the day when I was first writing this. And I came across this book. Uh, Angelo Spinelli was a battlefield photographer with the Signal Corps. He was drafted in 1941. He was from the Bronx in New York. He wasn't from South Dakota or Sturgis or anything. But his book is, is amazing. He was taken at the same time and location as the 109th Engineers, ended up in the same camp as them. But he managed to bribe a guard with cigarettes to get a camera. And you see the camera there, too. He took the only known photographs from a prisoner perspective in a prisoner war camp and happened to be the exact same prisoner war camp. And this book is just full of photographs of their lives there and everything. So you'll see a lot of his photos. It's an amazing resource. And I would encourage anybody who's interested in this group of people to go find this on Amazon or wherever you find it and uh, purchase it. It's called Life Behind Barbed Wire. The Secret World War II Photographs of Prisoner of War, Angelo M. Spinelli. So, amazing. I think, Bev, you just got one, didn't you? Did you find any helpful photos in there? Well, what's interesting is I have originals that my dad bought from Oh. Him. And okay. actually, my dad has a little journal where he drew the barracks, and I told you this. Yeah. My dad was in barrack number 18-1. Yeah. 
18. This guy was in barrack number 19. Okay. So there's one photo where I can find my dad. Awesome. And then, and then we have notes on the back of some of the other ones um, as far as others from 109. And not all his photos are in this book. He apparently had about a thousand photos when he managed to bring with him out of the prisoner war camp. And, uh, you know, they're, they're a, just a, an invaluable resource. So Angelo Spinelli, you'll be hearing his name quite frequently through this, despite the fact he's not one of the topics of our, our program today. All right. So many of the 109th engineers uh, were from South Dakota, Company F being the unit from Sturgis. Uh, it had moved to Sturgis in the mid-1930s when Captain William Brown was tasked with kind of regenerating, rejuvenating this unit that was up in, uh, I can't remember if it was Lead or Spearfish. And uh, he was a principal at the high school, and he started finding lots of young men that were just finishing school. And it was the Great Depression, so he encouraged a lot of them to join, and they did enthusiastically, including Bill Caton, who... Uh, graduated, I believe, in 1937 or 38. And uh, the unit itself was packed mostly with Sturgis boys. Uh, there were a few others from, you know, Rapid and Lead and Spearfish and stuff that were part of the group, but primarily Company F from Sturgis. Um, in late 1940, the federal government initiated an, a draft. Of course, by that time, Europe was at war for almost a year and a half, and they just felt that they needed to have a draft in place to prepare. Um, the 109th engin engineers were the first wave of guards groups, guards units to be uh, activated. They were activated in January um, and left in February for Louisiana. So on February 23rd, 1941, the Company F of the 109th Engineers from Sturgis was the first unit of the battalion to board a train. Uh, they began the journey here and headed east, picking up other soldiers and, and groups of soldiers as they progressed across the state. Um, and then they headed down through Iowa and picked up a few more people. Uh, they arrived, um, well, they left on February 23rd. They got a rousing send-off from the residents of Sturgis. The Sturgis Weekly Record said that 96 members of the unit marched from the local American Legion Hall to the train depot. I'm thinking this would be the, um, not the passenger depot that's up above the middle school, but it would be the freight depot, because that's the one the 4th Cavalry left from at that same, t roughly that same time when they headed out as well. So they would have gone up Main Street, which didn't go through at that point as it does now, and it would have gone underneath the railroad bridge at 8th Street and then up the hill to, the, to where the bus company is now. That's the same building. Um, so they were, they were, like I said, 96 members of the unit marched from the American Legion Hall. 35 members of the American Legion Post led the procession, followed by community leaders and families. There were approximately 300 automobiles in the procession. Uh, the train then picked up other companies as it worked its way across South Dakota and Western Iowa, and they arrived at Camp Claiborne in February 28, 1941. And then after that, other trains started arriving with what became the rest of the 34th Infantry Division, and that's what they were they were assigned to, uh, the Red Bull Division, um, and they were bringing in lots of these draftees and recruits. The National Guardsmen that had been called up for a year. Uh, were there to do the training. They already had the background in the military, so they were there to do the training of all the new draftees that were coming in. The Sturgis residents themselves were kept apprised of their training activities by a regular column uh, through 1941 on the front page of the Sturgis Tribune titled, News from Company F. It informed the community of the unit's training, social activities, and virtually every aspect of their life in camp. First Sergeant Robert Carson filed the news reports. He indicated the unit was receiving serious training, and he talked about conditions in camp, but then he also talked about uh, items for, that the individual soldiers were doing, different activities they were doing. He talked about um, who was on sick leave, who had come home on leave for a while and was on their way back. 
Um, but then he talked about some of the other activities that they had while they were there. Uh, members of the unit attending movies, going fishing, sightseeing in the ever here in the uh, bayou. Um, and then the Brooklyn Dodgers even had an exhibition game there for them, um, which was kind of cool. Of course, all that ended in December, on December 7, 1941, and they went into a war footing at that point. Um, of course, the deployment of the National Guard was extended indefinitely, and the uh, Red Bull Division itself, including the 109th, uh, went through restructuring. They wanted to get ready to go, because this it was inevitable now. Wars, wars been declared. Uh, so they were changed from a square division to a triangular division. I won't get into all that, because our time, I don't want to spend all my time just talking about division shapes, but um, it was formed of the Red Bull Division of approximately 20,000 soldiers, primarily from the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Iowa. And it was one of the first units to come to the nation's defense. Um, and you'll keep hearing that. The 109th Engineers were part of the very first wave of everything that happened in this war. Um, they were right there at the very tip of the spear, always. Um, in January 1942, the company moved to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and prepared to go overseas. There were a lot of false starts. Uh, there were, they had to wait for ships, they had to wait for a convoy, and then as they left, their ship broke down off the coast of Nova Scotia, and they had to come back to New York, get a different ship, wait for another convoy. But eventually, they arrived in Belfast on May 12, 1942. As the first American troops arriving in Europe, the Irish greeted the Americans warmly. Radio stations broadcast their arrival across all of the UK and the United States. Of course, in total disregard for security concerns. Um, camp conditions around Belfast were harsher than in Louisiana. And the Irish, along with the rest of Europe, had been fighting since 1939. So they were, they were on a better footing than you know, these Americans that were, were coming in to be trained by them. Uh, on May 27th, there was a new uh, first ranger battalion formed. 80% of the soldiers for that ranger battalion came from the Red Bull Division. Several members of Company, now Company C, I forgot to say that earlier, Company F from Sturgis became Company C during the restructuring. So you might hear me get those mixed up and turned around. I mean the same thing. Um, but several members of the 109th became part of this first ranger battalion. Uh, Leroy Swede Anderson, Jerry Gorman, and Richard Griffin being the ones from Sturgis that joined that. The Rangers immediately went off to Achnakari, Scotland, to train with the British commando unit. And here they faced rigorous training, with one Ranger actually being killed in a live fire drill. Um, the 109th was also going through some very intense training. American weapons, equipment, and uh, methods were really outdated. They hadn't, you know, really gotten into the groove of what modern warfare in World War II might be. Uh, and that became apparent during a mock battle with the British, called it the Atlantic Exercise. Um, the British used their years of experience, you know, almost two years at this point, of fighting um, to outmatch the Americans. And the 109th was reunited in August of 1942 then with the Rangers, the first Ranger Battalion, when they all moved to Western Scotland for additional training, this time on amphibious, amphibious assault, training with the British commando units. According to Tom Bowman, a member of Company C, and this is Bev's dad, correct? Yep. yep. Um, member of Company C, uh, they got there, and he said it was wet day and night, in the water, climbing into boats, and walking into in the water on the beach. We had to get used to the water and getting toughened up. So they all did their training and then boarded a, sh a boat. They didn't know they were, where they were going. Um, as it turns out, they were on their way to Operation Torch and the invasion of North Africa. Um, October 26, 1942, they left the British Isles. They, again, were speculating where they might end up. Um, some were saying Sicily or Italy. Walter Quartz, another member that wasn't from Sturgis, but was very close to all the Sturgis members. He was from Wyndham, Minnesota. 
um, stated that he liked to start ro rumors about where they were going. Before the night sets, we will be going east to invade France. And then, before the sun went down, we started heading east. <clears throat> so it was less than a, a year after Pearl Harbor, and the first American troops to face the Nazi war machine were on their way to North Africa. On November 8, 1942, the engineers went ashore in Algiers. Butch Barons reported the landing went off without a hitch. They landed right on target and were eight miles inland before they received any enemy fire. They hit some pockets of uh, significant fighting in the city of Algiers, but had occupied the entire area within 16 hours. Walter Quartz stated that the landing looked like a training exercise. Initially, there were no German troops, mainly Moroccan and, or French Moroccans and Italian troops. Uh, as they continued along the coast of North Africa, they finally received some significant resistance from the Germans near Casablanca. From December 3rd to December 6th, 1942, the commando units, including the American 1st Ranger Battalion, the newly formed, uh, continued, uh, found themselves pinned down during a raid near the town of Bizerta in Tunisia. After two confused days of fighting, the units detached and returned to the American lines. 134 men were killed or captured. The prisoners included many members of the 1st Ranger Battalion, including five members of the 109th Engineers. One of these men, Leroy Swede, oops, I thought I, there it is. Yeah. Uh, Leroy Swede Anderson became the first of all the Sturgis boys that became prisoners of war to be taken. Uh, he was listed in missing action on December 6, 1942. This would be repeated in coming months, but it took a long time for his family to find out what was going on. Um, information came slowly, and on January 7th, 1943, the Sturgis Tribune finally carried the headline, as you see here, Leroy Anderson, Italian prisoner. It made mention that he had a small son he had never seen, but had very little other information. Swede himself sent a letter in late December, but it took a long time to arrive back in Sturgis. He wrote, I am now a prisoner of war, but I'm all right. He mentions, they got Griffin, Richard Griffin, and I together. Jerry Gorman was with us, but I don't know if he was shot or taken prisoner as well. The Germans moved Anderson and the other prisoners to the Mediterranean shore and then flew them to Europe, first to Sicily and then to Naples in Italy, as some of the first American prisoners to be taken by the Axis powers. Hitler wanted to make a show of the American prisoners he had captured. Um, Jerry Gorman, as it turns out, was not taken prisoner or shot, as Anderson had speculated, uh, he made it back to the American lines. In a letter to his parents, which was printed in the Sturgis Tribune, April 15, 1943, Jerry briefly mentions their escape and writes, Swede Anderson was with us when he was captured. He also reported, our commando outfit, the 1st Ranger Battalion, has broken up and we've been returned to our old units. In Italy, Anderson's confinement was difficult. Little food and what he got was awful. Uh, lice covered all the prisoners all the time. In the first of several attempts, Anderson and an Englishman named Seddon managed to escape and elude the Germans for nine days. They were recaptured in the vicinity of Rome and returned to their camp. Anderson wrote to his wife a couple more times in January of 1943. In both letters, he asked for candy to be sent, as well as pictures of his wife and son. In two letters written in February 1943, he indicates he's still waiting for a box of food and candy and reminds her to ask his parents to send some too. He also asked for cigarettes, which would become a regular request from all the prisoners. Uh, cigarettes become the currency in the prison camps, as well as in exchanges with the prison guards and stuff. Um, it isn't until June 1943 more than six months after his capture, that Anderson finally acknowledges receiving a letter from his wife and another from his folks. There we go. Um, through January and February, the rest of the 109th engineers continued their combat mission in North Africa. In a letter to the editor of the Black Hills Press in Sturgis, dated January 2nd, 1943, but not printed until February 11th, and that's the story there. It's a little piece of the story, it's a long one. Um, the soldiers gave lighthearted updates 
on the various Sturgis members of the 109th. It mentioned a total of 50 individuals with nicknames and silly updates. Staff Sergeant Bob Tuggle Lodge is trying to corner the market on champagne. As far as we know, champagne doesn't fertilize the growth of hair. Sergeant Bill, alias Breezy, alias Ten Shilling Bill, alias Sherlock Holmes Caton, is rating on his dating. He must have been doing some bragging or something. Um, Sergeant Owen Grumpy Gorman, who is now on the other side of the bar, still has that beaming smile and talkative nature. A lot of sarcastic, sarcasm through it, but, you know, soldiers ribbing each other. Uh, Sergeant Gus Murray, no relation to Arthur, now leads us in our champagne quartets each evening with emphasis on court. So, ironically, when this report was finally printed uh, in the Sturgis paper on February 11th, uh, the 109th was already in place at Faid Pass, F-A-I-D. I'm hoping I'm saying that right, Faid Pass. Um, that's how I'm going to say it. So, um, It's an area advanced of Kasserine Pass, and it was presenting at the absolute tip of the Allied forces in North Africa. The other photograph here is Bill Caton with a couple of other officers. I'm assuming that those officers are actually pretty tall because Bill Caton was six foot eight. And that'll play into some of his story as he goes through on some of his escape attempts. He wasn't very good at hiding. <laughs> so, so here we'll, we can see um, where they were situated. Um, you can kind of see near the center, there's a thick blue line running from the top straight to the bottom. Spiky line. That's the forward American line. And if you look, there's a couple of arrows right in the very middle part of that line. There's a dot that says Faid, and that is ahead of the line. And that's where the 109th were stationed. They were positioned ahead of the extended American line, the secondary line being the one, the blue line that goes across the upper, uh, I guess it would be your left-hand side. On 4 a.m. on February 14, 1943, Valentine's Day, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's uh, Panzers, under the 5th Panzer Division, made a surprise attack. They roared through Faid Pass, the foremost position of the American section of the line, and the exact location of the 109th. The Germans went right past most of the foot soldiers, destroying tanks and large weapons as they drove well into the American lines and toward Kasserine Pass. According to Butch Barons, it was like watching a good football team play a poorer football team. First came the Stukas, the bomber planes, followed by the ME-109s, their fighter planes, and then the tanks. We watched the tank battle from about a mile away. We saw tanks going poof right before our eyes. We didn't have field glasses, so we didn't know that the tanks going poof belonged to us. The 109th suddenly found themselves stranded nearly 30 miles behind enemy lines. In desolate, rocky hilltops, the American soldiers dug into shallow holes and tried to hang on until help could arrive. Suddenly placed in the position of simply trying to survive, Company C moved to high ground on the top of a small mountain, Jabal Garrett Hadid. Sergeant Bill Caton remembered that they set up a defensive perimeter as best they could, but they had very little equipment or ammunition. Minnesotan Walter Quartz described the situation well. He was with the bulk of the Sturgis boys and tried to stay close to his good friend Bill Weimer. Lieutenant Royal Lee was organizing the unit, and Sergeant Caton grabbed Quartz and two other machine gunners and positioned them around the top of the hill. The Germans continued to shell the hill for the next two days. There was also German infantry and snipers at work. Quartz mentioned the second on his machine gun, Kenneth Brandon of Sturgis, took a shot through the fleshy part of his arm. The group stayed put for reinforcements, but none made it through. There were attempts, but no... They had to pull back every time. And this continued for three days. During that time, Bill Weimer received a severe injury in the leg. Weimer told the story to the Spearfish Queen City Mail on July 13, 1944. According to Weimer, at noon on February 16, 1943, he was hugging the earth, attempting to escape the constant strafing, shelling, and bombing when he was hit with a mortar. Weimer stated, I thought my body was shot off at the waist. I crawled along the ground on my elbows until I came to a foxhole, 
and as I dropped in head first, I saw my legs come behind me. I really thought they were gone. Weimer stayed in the Fox Hill until 8.30 p.m. without aid, other than self-applied tourniquets and a self-applied shot for lockjaw. He had shattered his left leg, and shrapnel injuries uh, occurred to his right leg and both his arms. Late on February 16th, that same night, the men on the hill received orders to retreat and gather 15 miles away at the nearby town of Jabal Hamir. After dark settled, the soldiers set out. During the night, the group of several hundred soldiers began to break into smaller groups and scatter in the dark. As the morning dawned, the Americans found themselves in small groups, unprotected on the flat plain of the desert. The Germans began to gather up the groups as they found them. Some groups fled into patches of cacti to hide, but very few were successful. Butch Barons of Sturgis, hiding in a clump of cacti with several others, planned to assault a German tank they thought they heard coming, uh, with nothing more than their rifles and a few hand grenades. However, as it approached, they saw it was a scout car, surrounded by American prisoners and German soldiers. With no other choice, Barons and his comrades surrendered. Bill Caton remembered that they had to leave some of the infantry and artillery wounded behind, as there weren't enough men to carry them. He stated, however, we took our own boys. We took our hometown boys. Caton figured he made it about 20 kilometers from the mountain during the night with a small group. When morning hit, we were right out on the desert floor with no cover, and of course, we were right in the middle of the German troops. It didn't take them long to round us up. We were collected in small groups and then broken up as the Sturgis boys were pretty well split up. Walter Quartz headed off the mountain with the same group as Bill Caton. As he remembered, someone asked Sarge Caton what to do when we ran out of ammo, and he replied, start throwing rocks, there's a lot of them lying around. Uh, Walter Quartz and Kermit Wright carried Bill Weimer, whose uh, leg injury would not allow him to go on his own. He said that Weimer told him, Walt, take me along. I still have a Tommy gun, and I can still fight lying down. As Weimer told the story, there was a full moon, but a little fog near the ground. He was being carried on a makeshift, makeshift stretcher. Excuse me. Uh, Wright and Quartz had to put him down frequently when they would hear a German tank or armored car coming. He remembered they would drop me and run for cover, and I'd lie there with my eyes closed and think, I'll never see those guys again. And then pretty soon I'd hear them whistle, and I'd whistle back, and they'd come and pick me up again. Quartz and Wright carried Weimer, carrying Weimer, were all captured in much the same fashion as the others. They carried their friend all day, all night, and much of the next day, dodging from hedge to hedge and ravine to ravine, when they, at about 10, with about 10 others, were walking and surrounded by four armored vehicles. At this point, Weimer remembers the German officer saying, for you, the war is over. The Germans used this rehearsed phrase uh, most commonly when taking prisoners. Sometimes they would say, you are now going to Deutschland to work for the Fuhrer. But they didn't say that to us, Weimer said. Quartz, Walter Quartz, made his weapon inoperable by jamming it into the sand and then surrendered. He worried for his friend Bill Weimer, who was injured, as rumor had it that the Germans would kill the injured. And Quartz worried for a long time after being separated what had happened to Bill. Others continued trying to find their way back to friendly area. Iowa members, a member of Company C, Tom Bauman. Is it Bauman or Bowman? Bauman. Okay, I had it right. Stated that he, a lieutenant, and two others hid in a drainage ditch and then in cacti for three days, trying to get through the German lines at night. They raided an Arab camp one night for eggs and were caught the next morning on the 19th of February. He felt one of the Arabs had spotted them and turned them in. Four half-tracks suddenly surrounded the cactus they were in, and they were told, Arouse mit du, out with you. In all, 42 members of the 109th Engineer Battalion were taken prisoner during this action. Ten Sturgis area men were captured. They were Staff Sergeant Robert Lodge, Sergeant Francis Gus Murray, Sergeant William Caton, Sergeant Owen Gorman, Corporal Richard Butch Barons, PFC Kenneth Brandon, PFC Kenneth Gourley, Tech 5 Leo Baker, PFC Wayne Hannant, and a wounded private William Bill Weimer. When combined with the earlier capture of Leroy Sweet Anderson of Sturgis assigned to the Ranger unit, a total of 11 Sturgis men were captured by the Germans. 
Other captives included Lieutenant Royal Lee, company commander from Brookings, Private Gordon Tomlinson, Tomsland from Rapid City, and Corporal Harold McGregor from Lead. Some other notable prisoners from Company C that we've recorded their experiences, and I keep mentioning, were Corporal Walter Quartz of Wyndham, Minnesota, and Tom uh, Bauman, I think, of Rock Rapids, Iowa. I think it, it was Bauman. I want to make sure I'm saying that right for you. In all, the 42 Company C captives, combined with five Rangers from the unit, captured at Bizerta, made for a total of 47 members of the 109th that were now prisoners of war. In the same fashion as Sweet Anderson before then, the Germans marched the prisoners by force to Safax and on to Tunis. Rumors were flying before and during the battle that the Germans would kill the prisoners. A story was told by Walter Quartz supporting this concern. He heard a prisoner complaining to the Germans about their use of dum-dum bullets, a bullet with the tip clipped so, so that it would flatten out and do, uh, inflict more damage. Following the soldier's complaint, two German soldiers took the GI behind a barn, Quartz said, two shots were heard, which left a very vivid impression on me. The Germans seemed to believe it was their best interest, however, to show off their captives, demonstrating their ability to totally defeat the Americans. They also wanted to show their mercy toward their prisoners for propaganda purposes. Bill Caton even states that General Rommel came to see them when they arrived in Tunis and spoke to a group of them, complimenting them highly and stating he wished he had them under his leadership. Bill Caton pointed out that during the march through Africa would have been the time to try and escape. He felt that everyone was just too confused and concerned with trying to stay together to consider the attempt. Courts also state that he and others actually discussed looking for an opportunity to make a break for it, but that opportunity never came. Before the chance came, they arrived in Tunis and were put in cage-like enclosures. The Germans loaded the prisoners onto transport planes, Junker JU-52s, for a flight to a then unknown destination. The prisoners were shuttled from Tunis to Palermo, Sicily, where they were held in a warehouse at the end of the docks. American bombers were also in the area, and bombing almost unwittingly killed their own men. They survived, but it was close. Because of his injuries, William Weimer was left behind. Guards placed him on a truck with wounded Arabs and told him, took him to an Italian hospital, where he laid in a bunk for five days. After his continuous demands for medical attention, an Italian doctor examined him, bandaged his wounds, and said, good, good. The next day, an Italian Red Cross ship took him on a four-day voyage to Bari, Italy. Bari, Italy. Here, he finally received medical attention, having the shrapnel removed and morphine for his pain. From Sicily, the Germans flew the other prisoners to Naples, Italy, to be processed and sent to various prisoner war camps, or Stalags, in Germany. Prior to this, the Germans shared their prisoners with the Italian allies for a time, allowing them a victory parade. A common theme comes from all the accounts recorded um, by the various survivors. They all commented about their horrible treatment by the Italian soldiers and the Italian people. Captain Billy Bingham, a member of the 34th Division, who experienced this treatment, ventured that the Italians wanted to demonstrate their loyalty to the Germans by mistreating us. Walter Court simply thought the Italians were probably thinking the world would soon belong to the Germans. Tom Bauman remembers the prisoners being paraded through the streets and residents pelting them with manure, tomatoes, whatever they could find. He also mentioned that one old lady came up to him and handed him a handful of sugar cubes. Walter Quartz also mentioned the nasty treatment, nasty language, and names. However, he also mentions that an old woman pressed an apple into his hand. Bill Caton describes the situation well. He stated that if the German guards had not intervened, the crowd would have killed them. So intense was their hatred. The men were taken off the planes, herded onto trucks, and paraded through the city. They had jeers, threats, insults thrown at them, along with old food, vegetables, and stones. Bill Caton advised the men, duck the stones and grab the chow. He describes the crowd as pressing closer and closer, hurling every vulgarity they could. He said that the Italian soldiers enjoyed poking their bayonets into the men to see them jump, or to see them in, hit them in the face with a rifle butt. He adds the American soldiers reacted bravely. 
These men from America had been defeated in battle, starved in pens in Tunis, many of them wounded, but they still stood up and shouted back any insult they could think of in the face of the guns and to the riotous crowd of half-mad Italians. They were not intimidated or afraid, not that they, that they were all brave men, but they were all men. The prisoners were kept in nearby Capua for a week in two-by-two two dugouts. The Germans processed the prisoners, getting their name, rank, and serial number, as well as any other information they could pry loose. By getting the rank of each man, the Germans determined where the prisoner would be sent. There were separate camps for officers, non-commissioned officers, and the enlisted men. Under the Geneva Convention, the Germans could not require the officers or the NCOs to work for them, but could put the enlisted men to work. Most of the Sturgis area men would end up together as they were almost wholly NCOs. Knowing that they didn't want to work for the enemy, prisoners sometimes lied when they were asked, identifying themselves as sergeants. Walter Quartz did just this. After conferring with Cap company commander Lieutenant Lee, Lieutenant Lee told him, Walt, I don't know if you should do that. They may shoot you if they find out you're lying. To which Quartz responded, thank you, but I have no intention of working for the Germans. He instantly gave himself a promotion from private first class to sergeant. Shortly after arriving in Capua, Sergeant Caton decided he had seen enough. Caton noticed that there were many German guards during the day, but just a few Italian guards at night, and they were prone to singing to each other and not paying much attention. He, along with a British sergeant, an American Air Force guy named Nettles, that's what he says, American Air Force guy named Nettles, crawled out under a wire. They were going to go someplace, but we didn't know where, because, hell, we didn't even know where we were. They traveled north to Switz toward Switzerland, walking for two days and one night. At one point, the British sergeant heard men speaking Italian and thought he could bluff them with the Italian he knew. They walked in to talk to the Italians, who turned out to be Germans. And they don't like to talk very much, Caton said. The soldiers returned the three escapees to Capua just in time to be loaded on a train and headed for Stalag 7A near Munich, Germany. Nearly a month had passed since the battle, but families back in Sturgis and other towns still had no official word of their sons, husbands, and fathers. They knew of the disastrous battle in the area of the Kasserine Pass and that many of their loved ones might or might not be safe. It wasn't until March 23, 1943, five weeks after the battle, that families began to receive official word. The Sturgis Tribune of that date reported of telegrams received by families in the Black Hills indicating seven Sturgis men missing in action, and two from nearby Spearfish. Judge H.W. Caton received one of those telegrams, and in a simple note to his daughter in Rapid City, my grandmother, Nettie, and I imagine uh, Mabel and Ruth probably got those letters too, um, he signed his, uh, he stated, just received a telegram from the Adjutant General that my son, Sergeant William R. Caton, has been reported missing in action in the North Africa area since February 17th. He signed his name and added a postscript at the bottom of the note. Nearly every family in Sturgis has a like message. The Sturgis Tribune reported those missing as William R. Caton, Owen Gorman, Robert Joseph Lodge, Theodore Baker, Kenneth Paul Gorley, Francis Murray, Dick Behrens, and Harold McGregor. A subsequent story on the Sturgis Weekly Record on April 1st reported these names and added Kenneth Brandon and Gordon Tomsland. The April 1st Sturgis Tribune reported that Judge Caton received a telegram from Congressman Francis Case stating that the Red Cross believed the local man to be alive and taken prisoner of war. Uh, over the next several weeks, official word began to reach the families from the War Department. The Weimer family of Sturgis received the first such notice being informed that their son William was an Italian prisoner and recovering from injuries in a military hospital near Bari, Italy. The intelligence received in North Africa was not much better. On March 17, 1943, a full month after the battle, Jerry Gorman wrote a letter to his parents, which they received in mid-April. He was all right, and regarding his brother, Owen is out someplace. I haven't seen him since I got back, but I guess he's okay. Owen had already been reported missing in action in a likely German prisoner of war. Owen Gorman and the other prisoners prepared to leave Capua, Italy, by train. The Germans loaded them in closed train cars. They were packed in tightly and had to stand the entire three days and nights as they traveled from Naples to Munich. 
They arrived at Stalag 7A, just outside of Munich, Germany. I have it marked there in red. I don't know if you can see that. Which served as a processing camp through which prisoners generally passed on their way to other camps. Thousands of prisoners of all nationality came through this camp, including English, Polish, French, Australians, and Russians. It was here that we began to hear one of the regular themes from the various prisoners regarding the German treatment of the uh, Russian prisoners. The Russians, under Joseph Stalin, uh, refused to sign the Geneva Accord, which would have allowed their prisoners minimal protections if taken prisoner of war. It guaranteed humane treatment, minimal standards, and access to Red Cross parcels. While Germans became experts at using the most minimal definition possible of these standards, the Russians had no protection at all. It's estimated that more than three million Russian prisoners of war died at the hands of the German captors. Walter Kortz remembered seeing the Russians stripped of everything. They even had their gold teeth knocked out. Not taken out, knocked out, he said. He also witnessed weak and sick Russians being loaded into a wagon and dumped in a lime pit with the dead while the bodies were still alive. The members of the 109th would witness more of this treatment of the Russians in their future locations. Once reading, reaching Stalag 7A, Sergeant Bill Caton made another attempt to escape. By his estimate, he was around 90 miles or so from Switzerland. He teamed up with a first lieutenant, formerly of the Bavarian Guard. He taught Caton enough basic German to read road signs, and they took off. After volunteering for a French work detail, they slipped away when they had a chance. According to Caton, we found walking a little rough as we were pretty well starved down by then. We had no preparation, no maps, no nothing. They followed railroad tracks into the Bavarian Alps until they needed to get some food. Near a small village, they tried to beg some food off an old farmer. We claimed the Hail Hitler and the German army, Caton said, but the farmer likely saw through it and reported them as German soldiers waited for them when they went through the next village. Caton understood that at six foot, eight inches tall, he couldn't exactly blend in. The Germans returned Caton and the lieutenant to Stalag 7A, putting Caton in solitary confinement, also known as the cooler. 30 days was typical when caught trying to escape, but after only a few days in the cooler, the guards pulled Caton out. The Germans shipped the prisoners to their new camps. While two members of the 109th had already taken different paths from the others, specifically Sweet Anderson and William Weimer, the group was now divided more extensively, with members headed to several different prisoner war camps. Of the 47 prisoners of the 109th taken in North Africa, the vast majority of them, 26, went to Stalag 3B. 13 went to Stalag 2B, and eight others were divided amongst the four other camps, amongst four other camps. The prisoners from Sturgis area managed to stay largely together. Two captives from Sturgis, enlisted men Wayne Hannant and Theodore Leo Baker, were sent to Stalag 2B near Hammerstein, Germany. Reputed to be one of the harshest camps for American POWs, most soldiers at this camp did forced labor for the Germans. The other eight were sent to Stalag 3B at Furstenberg on the Oder near Berlin, and I have 2B in yellow, I believe it is. Yeah, yellow. Uh, up kind of just below Berlin, near the top of the map there. This eight included, oh, it was a camp for non-commissioned officers, sorry. This eight included Staff Sergeant Robert Lodge, Sergeant William Caton, Sergeant Owen Gorman, Sergeant Francis Gus Murray, Corporal Dick Butch Barons, PFC Ken Brandon, and PFC Ken Gourley. The eight, an eight Sturgis prisoner of the unit at Stalag 3B would eventually be Leroy Sweet Anderson. Other notable members of the unit scattered in a similar fashion. Lieutenant Royal Lee, initially sent to Stalag 3B, went on to Offlog 64, Officers Lager 64 for officers, near the town of Zubin in Poland. Corporal Harold McGregor from Lead stayed at Stalag 7A, while Private Gordon Tomsland went to Stalag 2B. Company C members, corporals, now sergeants, Walter Kortz of Wyndham, Minnesota, and Thomas Bowman of Rock Rapids, Iowa, both landed in Stalag 3B with the bulk of the Sturgis men. Since many of the 109th ended up in Stalag 3B, most of the information written and shared by members were regarding this camp. 
of course, here's one of the photos of Angelo Spinelli, and that's the guard tower at Stalag 3B. Uh, they arrived on March 29, 1942, roughly six weeks after we taken prisoner. The camp was located along a canal, roughly 60 miles southeast of Berlin. The camp measured approximately 870 yards by 870 yards with triple barbed wire fence. Guard towers boarded the entire camp. The Germans divided the camp into four separate sections for the various nationalities held here. Eventually, it would hold 12,000 Russians, 8,000 French, 3,500 Americans, and 1,000 Serbians. Each section was fenced and divided by a 10-foot no man's land. Anyone crossing the wire into the no man's land would be shot immediately by the German guards. The American compound measured about 100 yards by 870 yards with six barracks buildings, later expanded to 12. Each building held from 300 to 450 men. Upon their arrival, the Americans were deloused and given a hot shower, the first one in a long time. They also had a tetanus shot jab straight into their chest. They were assigned to a barracks, and each man took a bunk, which had a burlap mattress filled with straw and wood chips. The mattress was crawled with fleas, lice, mice, and ticks. The center of the barracks contained a toilet and a heater, which divided it in two sections. The prisoners received a dozen or so briquettes of a week of very low-grade coal to heat the building. One small stool served as a toilet. However, an outdoor toilet also existed, and prisoners used that most of the time. When the outdoor toilet pit filled, a group of Russian prisoners would be sent to shovel them out in a honey wagon. They then spread this on nearby, nearby German fields for fertilizer. The day would begin about 6.55 a.m. Men would roll out just in time for 7 o'clock roll call. Guards did roll call twice a day. Prisoners made roll call as frustrating as possible for their guards by having men squat down in the back or move around to change the count. Roll call could take some time in this fashion, but gave the prisoners a chance to irritate the guards. It allowed them to cover for individuals that could not make roll call either due to sickness or escape. The guards would get wildly different counts from time to time and day to day. And these are a couple of Spinelli's photographs. He actually went to the restroom while they were doing it with the express purpose of taking a picture with his secret camera. And you can see people ducking down in the back row there. People are ducking down, they're moving around. You can see people on the far picture there walking around and stuff. And there's a gentleman right here who's ducking down. A couple others have their heads down. So breakfast followed roll call. The prisoners had free time until lunch and then free time again until the late afternoon roll call. Then they ate dinner, such as it was. The meals were routine. Breakfast consisted of ersatz coffee, made from scorched barley. Ersatz means imitation. For lunch, they had more ersatz coffee and rutabaga soup. And you can see them carrying the soup here in the first photograph. Most of the prisoners commented specifically on the soup, remembering frequently finding a horse head or parts of a, other parts of a horse floating in the soup, along with maggots that could be picked out and eaten for protein. Dinner consisted of more soup, sometimes a moldy potato and a chunk of black bread made partly from sawdust. A piece of cheese was a luxury, but it usually crawled with maggots. Francis Murray and other Catholics in the camp joked each Friday about removing the maggots so they didn't eat meat. <laughs> Survival in the camp was, was more of a mental game at times. Um, beginning in Stalag 7A, the Americans learned from the British they need to have a strict hierarchy and organize every detail of their day. The ranking American prisoner was the man of confidence. He acted as their commander and the direct contact in dealing with the Germans. And the photograph here by Spinelli shows the American man of confidence, Staff Sergeant Joseph C. Gasparich, when he's talking with, about Red Cross packages. He negotiated the details of daily life and took complaints to the Germans as well. He received assistance from a long list of individuals filling a variety of jobs. Some soldiers helped with equal distribution of food. Others acted as interpreters. Some men collected radio material or maps. 
There was even an escape committee to coordinate details and be prepared should an opportunity for escape present itself. Bill Caton involved himself in these activities. From his previous two attempts to escape, he understood the need to speak German well and have the intelligence materials available should he get another opportunity to escape. He spent as much time as he could with anyone that could speak German to learn the language. After a couple months in camp, he started serving as an interpreter. Not only did it give him a chance to practice his German, but to re refine it as he spoke with the guards and listened to their speech. The prisoners never received enough food to remain healthy. While this made some people desperate, the prisoners punished anyone that stole from a fellow prisoner. Accounts exist of some of the punishment the prisoners received when they had been caught stealing. Walter Quartz recounted a thief being required to dig a grave in the yard and bury his food in it. He then had to dig up the food and fill the entire hole again before he could eat. Bill Caton remembered a more severe punishment. He said that people caught stealing could be forced to crawl down the hole in the toilet that had not seen the honey wagon for a while and spend the night there. He stated it generally took the thief about two weeks before he could even get back on his feet again after he spent the night out there. Uh, there are other reports of broken arms, head shaved with a T for thief, and all this quickly put an end to any thoughts of thievery. The arrival of packages from the Red Cross and home saved the men from starvation. Under the Geneva Convention, the Red Cross should be allowed to deliver packages to the camps for all the American prisoners once a week and packages from home twice a month. The Germans sometimes kept the Red Cross packages for themselves and required the prisoners to divide the contents, but the packages did get to them eventually. Each package contained many cherished items, including chocolate, real coffee, powdered milk, margarine, canned meat, crackers, and a variety of other items. Cigarettes turned out to be the most important item. You can kind of see what's in there. Several packages of cigarettes. There's a fruitcake in the middle. There's M&Ms. A lot of different things. While most of the prisoners smoked, the cigarettes also served as valuable currency. Other items in the Red Cross package could be traded, but the cigarettes made perfect items for trade with other prisoners or even to bribe the guards. Men would write home asking for extra cigarettes and cigars, which could be used for money. In his letter to his wife, Ruth, Sweet Anderson asked frequently for tobacco, saying, I still want you to send me some smoking items and candy bars, and when you see my folks or Mick or Cub, tell them they can do the same. He also reminded her that she should send a package every two weeks. Bill Caton described the trading and bribing that occurred with the guards. It would start with trading a few items to show them how safe it was and to get them hooked. Caton said they would all pinch in a cigarette or two into a blackmail fund used for items the men needed, such as medicine. After a while, he would offer the guards a couple of cigarettes for free. He stated, these poor devils had nothing either. You would even light it for him. And right about the time he took his second big drag, you would mention that the intelligence officer was asking just the other day what guards were taking favors from the Americans. If you were particularly mean, you would spend a whole week at this first, giving him eight or ten cigarettes and sneak him a cup of coffee. The guards would get in trouble if anyone found out, uh, but also found out that no one seemed to notice. Through this method, the prisoners got extra food smuggled in and even parts for their radios. If they did find a guard unwilling to trade with the prisoners, they might threaten to turn him in for being Jewish. This would be a death sentence to a German soldier. Bill Caton said, we would tell the guard, your nose is a little hooked. I bet your grandmother was Jewish and you're hiding it. That would be, scare them to death. Of course, we already talked about how Corporal Anthony Spinelli traded cigarettes for his camera and, and to have his film developed. He never did take pictures, though, of the guard that helped him. He said he, he didn't want him getting in trouble for it, so... The relationship with the guards proved pivotal for much of the success of the prisoners. The guards themselves, while not dumb as portrayed in the movies and television, often were not the most motivated. Usually quite old or quite young, the guards simply wanted to avoid being sent to fight the Russians. <clears throat> Mostly veterans of World War I, the guards didn't feel, weren't fed much better than the prisoners. However, they followed orders and could be hard on the prisoners. Raids for contraband, trying to disrupt escape 
attempts or simply to find an excuse to steal the soldiers' cigarettes happened. Walter Quartz remembered that old gold cigarettes had the slogan, freedom is our heritage, we cannot afford to relinquish it. The guards would confiscate the old gold cigarettes as propaganda so they could smoke them themselves. Boredom, loneliness, and physical and mental health became the largest enemies that the men had. Several reported men losing their will and not getting out of bed. Because of the support they had together, none of the Sturgis men, or those from the 109th, reported falling into this depression. They all walked regularly around and around the fence line to keep fit. They also kept involved in many camp activities. And here you can see the walking path around the fence line there. And people just standing by the fence line. There was, wasn't a lot to do some days, and th that filled their time. Um, Bill Caton stayed involved in the escape committee and his future plans for escape. Others leaned on religion, sports, books, and other distractions to get them through. The Germans even enjoyed some of the American activities. Prisoners organized many sporting activities. The YMCA sent regular packages to the camps, and they usually contained equipment for activities such as boxing, football, soccer, basketball, and the camp favorite, baseball. The men even organized teams with names and uniforms. Yeah, the uh, YMCA sent musical instruments so they could have an orchestra, all kinds of things. Baseball became so popular among the German officers and guards that American con prisoners convinced them to expand one part of the barbed wire fencing to enlarge their field. <clears throat> Dignitaries sometimes came from nearby Berlin to watch the games of baseball or football. And there was often five baseball games in a day on a nice day. The prisoners even formed a marching band to perform. Boxes of books also arrived from the YMCA, Red Cross, and civic groups in the States. <clears throat> the camp library boasted between 10,000 and 13,000 volumes, cataloged, filed, and placed on shelves made from Red Cross cartons in Barrack 17. Yeah, Barrack 17, when you look at who, what barracks everybody was assigned to, they had cleared out Barrack 17 and all added on to the other barracks. Barrack 17 was used exclusively as like their community center kind of building. Sturgis's Gus Murray kept an extensive list of all the books he read while he was in the camp, as did many other people. They wanted to show they were productive, I guess. <clears throat> the men also built a stage in Barrack 17 from Red Cross cartons and began putting on productions. Plays, singing, and band concerts kept the men busy. They spent hours and even days making sets from garbage, sewing costumes, making programs, and practicing their roles. The men even devised a revolving stage. The Germans would loan them tools and equipment on parole. The plays became so popular that tickets were issued to see one of five performances. Anthony Spinelli took many photographs of these productions. You can see the rotating stage here on the left, and then one of the play productions on the right. And there are so many pictures in this book of the different plays, and men dressed up like women because that's the role they were playing, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, dance routines they did, and everything. It's pretty amazing. He took a lot of pictures of those. Religion was also Im very important to many of the prisoners. Barrack 17, which also housed the library and the theater, became the home to the camp chapel. The YMCA supplied many religious articles. With so much time on their hands, the prisoners also worked on making the chapel comfortable. With pieces of wood, broken bits of colored glass, and items they found, they made an altar, a mural, and even stained glass mosaics. For the Catholic services, a Polish priest, Father Samalowicz, would say Mass. A POW made rosaries from bits of wire and beads, and Gus Murray, a devout Catholic, remembered saying at least one rosary a day in camp. The Germans liked to show off Stalag 3B. Due to its location near Berlin and the industrious nature of the prisoners in the camp, the Red Cross and Swiss legation both toured the camp. They checked to see if the Germans adhered to the Geneva Convention and treated the prisoners properly. While the treatment of the prisoners could be brutal at times, they, bared, they fared better than some other camps, and the Germans made sure the visitors saw what would be the best parts of the camp. One part of the camp the inspectors did not get to tour held the Russian prisoners. 
Every one of the prisoners from the 109th mentions the brutal, the brutality that rained down on the Russian prisoners. Because the Russians had not signed the Conven Geneva Convention, there were no requirements to protect them. The Germans and the Russians fought a particularly harsh war as well, with brutalities occurring on both sides. This left the Germans with strong hatred for these prisoners. The Germans starved the Russians to death, shot them for imagined infractions, and worked them until they dropped. Gus Murray remembered, the Germans knew how to the ounce how much food it took to keep a man alive and fed the Russians just a little below that to slowly starve them to death. He recounts Americans collecting a few items from Red Cross boxes and bribing the guards to look away while they threw them over the fence. Tom Bauman remembered seeing wagons go through the Russian camp two or three times a day to pick up the dead. He never saw the bodies thrown in the ovens, but he could smell them. He said the Russians would eat the rats that the Americans would kill and throw over to them. Bill Caton also remembered this, describing the big fuzzy rats that would come up from the nearby canal and the men attempting to catch them. The Americans actively traded with the Russians when they had a chance, as with the French on the other side of the camp. But while the Americans and French received little or no punishment, the Germans shot the Russians on the spot. Russians would hold up their friends that had died during the night at roll call so more rations would be issued. And this is a picture here, for of a, and it's kind of a grisly picture, but the little arrow pointing there in the middle is a photo from Spinelli that shows a dead Russian prisoner who tried to pick up a cigarette somebody threw to him. Well, much of what the prisoners needed or wanted could be received through mail, trading, stealing, or bribing. Some things the prisoners had to build or make. They showed their ability by variety, building a variety of things from library shelves to churches. One prisoner at Stalag 3B remembered a German officer telling the prisoners, we can't leave anything, any metal things around with you people. You are so inventive that you'd probably build a tank. The prisoners could not cook their food effectively with the poor ersatz coal that was provided. It was basically just uh, charcoal is all they were given. It wasn't real coal. To remedy this, they started building blower devices you can see here, um, blower devices, which could best be described as Rube Goldberg devices. It acted as a bellows and very effectively blew air into the airsots coal, heating it enough to cook food. Another very useful item the prisoners built was radios. Most of the prisoners mention the radios in their memoirs. A couple of men listened to the BBC each day and passed along the news of the war. The men made the radios from a variety of materials and they bribed the guards to become the source for many of the parts. They stole other items from the Germans or found them on buildings such as copper wire. <clears throat> Bill Caton pointed out that they never used two-way communication. He said, on Hogan's Heroes, they had a coffee pot they'd talk into, but we never had that. The Germans frequently searched for the radios. They would be alerted when prisoners in the camp knew too much detail about the war, often more than the Germans knew due to the pro Nazi propaganda. Caton states that prisoners would say, we know you lost Stalingrad last week, and the Germans' news hadn't carried it. Caton added, to combat this, the prisoners would plant dummy radios, sometimes even working sets, to allow something for the Germans to find when they raided. The Germans would dash in with all their dogs, guards, and everything and run us out. They would tear up the barracks and find the radio. They would bring it out, stomp on it, and tear it all up, and take anyone who lived near it to the cooler. Of course, our active set was another place entirely. In fact, we had one at 3B for nearly two years, quite operable. Of course, while life at Stalag 3B sounds fairly easy, a different reality existed. The guards could be easier to get along with, but the officers and the SS were very harsh. Many of the prisoners reported abuses, beatings, and men being shot with very little provocation. Butch Barons reports the SS keeping the entire camp out in the rain all day, under machine gun cover while they tore apart all of the book, barracks looking for radios and contraband. He said they took all of the good stuff and just for good measure sent us, to, sent us through a delousing. After being doused with kerosene and washed with cold shower, the Germans baked their clothes and shaved the prisoners' heads. In reference to a similar event, Gus Murray remembered being forced to stand in the winter cold for 12 hours while the SS searched the camp. Men would fall to the ground out of weakness and cold. The Germans were also very harsh on escape attempts. 
Men involved in escape plots could be beaten and thrown in the cooler for 30 days, while others caught trying to escape would sometimes be shot on the spot. The Americans did get some revenge once by flooding an escape tunnel with water, nearly drowning the German guards crawling through it looking for escapees. Angelo Spinelli remembered being shot at once for reaching across the wire into no man's land to retrieve a baseball. I saw a puff go right in front of me as I bent down. It was a good thing I was bow-legged. The bullet went right through my trousers and in between my knees. I ran around the building so he couldn't get another shot off. While the other prisoners in Stalag 3B continued past their confinement, Sweet Anderson continued his in Italy. After his attempt to escape, the Germans gave him solitary confinement. He then resumed his captivity, dutifully writing to his wife in Sturgis. In a letter of June 14, 1943, Swede's tone changed. He acknowledges finally receiving mail from home, but he also writes, If you don't get my mail from me as often as you think you should, don't stop writing to me. This may be a way of telling his wife he would appreciate getting more, getting more mail, but it also may be a way of softening the blow if he didn't write for a while because Swede was about to try to escape again. While he did not detail how they slipped away, Anderson, along with Richard Griffin, another American and a British soldier, escaped again in Italy. Free for several days, the Germans recaptured Anderson, the other American, and the Brit. Griffin was not taken at that time, and it would be a while before Anderson would hear any news of him. The Germans did not feel generous about Anderson's second escape attempt. They lined up three along the wall and were preparing to shoot them. In a scene you would only imagine in a movie, a German lieutenant came along just in time to stop the killings. He ordered the men not to shoot, and according to Anderson, told them, even as a prisoner of war, you must give a man credit for trying to be a soldier and trying to escape. While the officer might have saved his life, Anderson was still punished. Once again, he received 30 days close confinement, and then received a prison transfer to a Jewish concentration camp in Germany. He remained in an enclosure attached to the Jewish prisoners for several weeks. Finally, Anderson, through intercession of the Swiss Red Cross, was sent to Stalag 3B. In a letter to his wife dated December 11, 1943, the first he had written in several months, he describes his escape and recapture. I suppose you think it's funny that you have not heard from me, but I couldn't help it. I was free for nine days. I thought I was going to get home soon, but the Germans recaptured me, and now I'm a prisoner in Germany. He mentions in a letter of December 11 that he now is now in Stalag 3B. He asks for a new picture and says the Germans took his when they recaptured him. He also states that he is now with Bob Lodge, Owen Gorman, and the others. Swede had finally returned to Company C. Bill Caton verified this when he states, they rounded up a bunch of guys down in Italy and shipped them up here. It was a big problem. What were we going to do with them? So the man of confidence and I went down there to screen them. First one I see was Swede wandering around, Swede Anderson. Dick Kiefer, came, Dick Kiefer from Rapid City had been in that shipment too. That was a reacquaintance. Bill Weimer continued his to be held in Italy as well. After rising at the hospital in Bari, Italy on February 28th and receiving basic care, he stayed there until April 7th when he was transferred to a prisoner of war hospital in Altamura, Italy. While there, gangrene moved into his right leg and he had demanded to have it amputated. On April 30th, the doctor removed his leg. He recuperated in Altamora until August of that year, when the Germans moved him to Stalag 344 near Lambsdorff, Germany. He reported, every nation in the world was re represented in that prison camp. Guards and prisoners were men like me, minus legs and arms. He survived and adjusted to his new condition until the spring of 1944 when Weimer became one of 15 Americans to be part of a larger prisoner exchange. He traveled through Marseille, Marseille, France, Barcelona, Spain, and Algiers in North Africa, and by the first part of July was home in Sturgis. For Bill Weimer, the war really was over. At Stalag 3B, the other members of Company C continued their captivity for another year. While their activities kept the prisoners occupied, some could not escape could not get escape out of their minds. Bill Caton had tried escaping twice before. He worked with the escape committee, and a group of them came up with a new plan to get out. Under the Geneva Convention, the Germans could not make American officers and non-coms work for them. However, to break the board and confinement of camp life, some did volunteer. 
they would be sent out with Russian or French work teams to work on area farms. The escape committee began volunteering to gain the German trust and look for an opportunity to take flight. They would then break up and try to make their own way out of Germany. In 1944, Bill volunteered to work on a large farm run by a wealthy old woman. According to Caton, that was probably the most delightful three months I ever spent in my life. I think every one of us, with one or two exceptions, were born and raised on farms. Yet we tore up every piece of machinery on the place. The prisoners didn't want to be too helpful. Caton waited for the opportunity and then took off, this time with another prisoner named Eddie Nielsen. They wandered at an area where they thought they could make contact with the Polish underground. After three days, they decided to split up. Caton could speak German, but Eddie only spoke Danish and Norwegian, so he wanted to contact some of them and go out through Poland. Caton headed south toward France. He jumped on a train and made it to Metz, France. By this time, he had been on the road for nearly a month and needed to find some food. This must have been June, as Caton states that while he was traveling, the Normandy invasion took place. Otherwise, he doesn't indicate a timeline for this. He decided to confide in someone and approach who he thought was a city policeman. He told them about being an escaped prisoner and needing some help. If this had been a city policeman, he might have had some luck, but it turned out to be a French gendarmerie nationale, a branch of the Vichy French police working for the Germans. The young officer took Caton to his house where his wife fed him a nice meal. While he ate, the Germans arrived to pick him up. The Germans gathered Caton and a few other Americans and French prisoners at the German border, and they told Caton, you like to walk and escape, so now you can walk back to where you came from. A few guards started marching the group across Germany. They walked for about a week and tried to wear down the guards. They limped along and sat, and then they limped some more. They wanted to find a chance to get away. The Germans finally got tired of it and shipped Caton to a political prison camp. According to Caton, he received a five-minute German court-martial in which the Germans stripped him of his military rights and threw him in a small dark cell. The guards interrogated him daily and fed him nothing but bread and a little cheese. He would scream and holler at them and bluff as best he could. After a couple of weeks, they shot a couple of prisoners that tried to escape, and Caton started to get nervous. <clears throat> he continued to yell and carry on and bluff. He wasn't sure what they would do with him. He said, I guess... They had a pretty good option, but they didn't choose to use it. One day they took him from his box, and while he was expecting the worst, they stuck him on a train, and he ended back at Stalag 3B, right where he started. 1944 also saw a new influx of prisoners in the camp. The Norman Normandy invasion had occurred in June, and a new wave of prisoners arrived, then in, again in December following the Battle of the Bulge. Several pres uh, prisoners mentioned do this. They remember the Germans coming to them in November of 1944, demanding all of their surplus clothing and jackets for the use of new prisoners. Most of the Americans smelled a rat and refused to render their, and refused or rendered their extra clothing unusable. Later, they learned the Germans dressed their troops in American uniforms during their counter-offensive during the Battle of the Bulge. On January 31st, 1945, the prisoners received orders to evacuate Stalag 3B. The war had turned for the Germans. The Russian army was closing in from one direction and the Allied army from the other. The German officers at Stalag 3B did not want to be captured by the Russians. They feared retaliation for the bad acts towards Russian army and the Russian prisoners. The prisoners grabbed what they could and began a forced march that would last eight days and cover 90 miles and be one of the most single identifiable memories of the entire, of the entire group. According to Butch Barron's, rumors of the evacuation had been around for a couple days. He and his bunkmate built a sled from a few of the slats in their bed to drag their belongings. The actual announcement came only three hours before the beginning of the march. <clears throat> Most of the men did not prepare like Barron's. They carried what they could grab, which included their blowers, blankets, spare clothes, food, etc. Even Barron's had to leave things behind despite his sled. During the march, however, people quickly shed the items they had gathered. The entire route was littered with blowers, clothing, books, and other items. The men became so weak that many of them began, began to fall. And if the guards, particularly the SS, saw anyone fall, they would shoot them. Angelo Spinelli fell and could not go on. 
He had the good fortune of another prisoner grabbing him and lifting him onto a German wagon. For whatever reason, the wagon driver did not stop them, and Spinelli rode the rest of the trip. Had a guard seen this act, both Spinelli and the man that helped him would have been shot. Gus Murray also had problems. His knee almost gave out. One of his bunk mates, Earl Furness, helped him walk. The march continued for over a week. There was little or nothing to eat and freezing nights to endure. Men slept in bombed out buildings, pig sties, outhouses, wherever they could. Even a few of the guards began to falter. These Volkstrom guards, comprised mostly of old men, meant to free up younger men to fight at the front, could not push any harder than the prisoners. Always one to grasp an opportunity, Bill Caton took advantage of the situation. He and another soldier named Krogman struck up a conversation with a Volkstrom guard. Struggling with the pace, Caton and Krogman stayed with the guard for the first three days of the march. Caton described how they could help him carry his equipment, and even at one point they carried his rifle. All the while, they continued to build doubt in his mind, saying how the Germans would lose the war and he didn't want to be caught by the Russians. Nearing dark on the third day, the two convinced the guard he would be best to leave the column. Caton said, when they went around a corner, we kept going straight up into the woods and hid behind the hill until the column got out of sight. They left the guard behind and headed for the Russian lines. But after two days of trying to get through, Caton changed his mind. Those damn Russians would shoot at anything that moved. I told Krogman, you go on to Russia if you want to, but I think I'll head back over toward Berlin. He went back toward Berlin and arrived there two or three days after the rest of the column. He fell in with some Holland Dutch that worked for the Germans, who allowed him to stay with them for a few weeks. The rest of the column finally reached Stalag 3A near Luken, Luchenwald, according to, located a few miles south of Berlin. The camp population had swollen to over 38,000 prisoners from many countries. Canvas tents housed the American prisoners in this early February weather. They slept on the ground on straw and did not receive much food. Almost 2,400 men shared two water faucets and three trench-style outhouses. Um, they became infested with lice from the straw bedding and, with no Red Cross parcels reaching them, started to suffer from malnutrition. These would be the conditions for the next three months. The war had turned badly for the Germans, and the prisoners also had to worry about what might happen next to them. Rumors went through the camp that Hitler wanted all the POWs killed. After staying with the Dutch for a few weeks, Bill Caton decided he did not want to be around when the Russians came through. He knew the general location of the American lines and decided to try to make it across. He traveled cautiously for several days, avoiding the SS. He slipped into the woods one night to avoid the German group and cautiously moved from tree to tree. He sent someone ahead of him and stopped behind a tree to watch. After a while, he saw form slowly appear from behind the tree. He decided to fake his way through the situation and yelled in German, come out and identify yourself. Caton said the other guy yelled back, I'm Sergeant Schwartz, or whatever he thought of a name at that minute. Caton told him he would fire if he didn't come out and identify himself. They continued shouting at each other in the woods where they had been sneaking along when, according to Caton, all of it once, he hit me. And I said, Eddie? And he said, Bill, is that you? Bill had run into Eddie Nielsen again, with whom he had escaped about nine or ten months earlier. They traveled together for a while, trying to get across the Elbe River, where they heard the American lines waited. They kept tripping over SS and German soldiers, fighting to control the thousands of refugees that were flooding the area. Bill and Eddie separated when Eddie decided to cross further down the river. Bill decided to give it a try right there. He lay by the river until night, he found a rubber raft, and with the help of a couple of German refugees and two Polish girls, inflated it and started across the river. The river was about half a mile wide, and when about halfway across, the raft sank. Bill drug one of the Polish girls to the far shore, but he never saw any of the others again. He lay still until morning, watching for German patrols. He finally got up and started walking through the woods, when suddenly he heard, in English, halt. Those were the nicest words I ever heard, Caton said. I told him, I'm Sergeant William R. Caton, Company C, 109th Engineers of the 34th Infantry Division. The man said, there's no 34th Infantry Division in this area. To which he said, there is now. Where's the mess sergeant? 
Caton simply concluded, so that was the end of it. After more than two years and two months, four escapes, and several prison camps, Bill Caton was a free man. The liberation of Stalag 3A occurred about the same time. On the morning of April 21st, 1945, the camp fell silent. The prisoners awoke to find the German guards and officers gone. They had all fled ahead of the Russian army. For one day, the prisoners remained alone, and then on April 22nd, the Russians entered the camp. The Russian appearance shocked the prisoners. The Russian appearance shocked the soldiers. Bob Hoffman reported they were the meanest, scruffiest, roughest group of men and women I had ever seen. Tom Bauman remembers, they didn't have modernized kitchens like we had or the Germans. They ran their cows along the side, and whenever they needed one, they'd butcher it. Those Russians had horse-drawn vehicles, and women and children were fighting. There they'd go with pistols on their hips. They didn't seem too concerned with the American prisoners. They dropped off some bacon and continued to the Battle of Berlin. Then the prisoners were alone. They reacted in different ways to being liberated. Um, some men waited, hoping that someone would come along and take them, while others began to walk, trying to find a way to the American lines. Butch Barons and several other pr prisoners headed out right away. They walked for several days towards Magdeburg when they heard the American army had built a pontoon bridge. They ended up in Wittenberg instead, where the Russians controlled the bridge. They started across the bridge with a group of refugees and were turned back by a Russian soldier with a machine gun. They slipped away from the group and headed toward the point of the American crossing when they ran into some American troops headed to liberate their camp. An officer told them to jump onto one of the American trucks and it would take them out. Barron said, we didn't waste any time following instructions. Tom Bauman waited around the camp for nearly a week. They had to go into town and forage for food. In town, the German women begged them to stay with them and protect them from the Russians. Unarmed, weak, and undernourished, they returned to the camp. At night, they could hear the screams of the German women as they were beaten, raped, and even killed by the Russians. Butch Barons told the same story, saying the German women begged for them to stay. After a week, Tom and several others got tired of waiting in the camp and began to walk. They walked about 25 miles towards the Elbe River when they ran into troops headed to help the prisoners in the camp. After being liberated, the former prisoners were gathered at a former German fighter air base near Hildesheim. They were deloused and given clean clothing before being flown out on C-47s in groups of 26. Again, Angelo Spinelli is back to taking pictures now. <clears throat> um, Gus Murray remembered being flown out on May 12, 1945. It was the happiest day of my life, he said. Illness dampened Butch Barron's experience. While the at the airfield awaiting transport, he fell sick with serious kidney condition. He would spend the next year in military hospitals before a full recovery. The Army transported the prisoners to a rehabilitation camp near Le Havre, France, and it's H-A-V-R-E. And I don't know if it's Le Havre or if it's like Brett Favre and it's Le Havre. I don't know. Um, <laughs> they, at Le Havre, France, called Camp Lucky Strike. Here they received medical inspections, updated their records, and began to receive deeds and healthy food. Being careful not to feed them too much too fast, the Army fed them eggnog and chicken for the first few days. According to Gus Murray, they received all the eggnog they wanted, but no bourbon. <laughs> During this time, the former prisoners contacted their loved ones. Letters, telegrams, and messages began arriving in Sturgis about mid-May. In a letter to Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Gordon, Gorman, sorry, dated April 29, 1945, which was printed in the Sturgis Tribune, Owen Gorman informed his parents of his return to the U.S. lines. It read, Dear folks, I hardly know what to say in this letter. I got back through our lines day before yesterday. I don't know where Francis Murray or any of the rest are. I was with Francis until a few days before our crossing our lines. I expect to see him come in any time. I have a lot to tell you and ask you, but it'll all wait a little longer. All I will say now is I am well and fill the icebox because I'll be home soon. Love, Owen. More letters followed. Judge H.W. Caton and his family heard from Bill Caton in a letter written May 7th and received May 21st. In it, he said, I'm still in Germany, but hope to rectify that soon. I'm getting well filled up on the best food I've seen in two and a half years. A telegram received from the Red Cross by Camilla Murray on May 20th informed her that her son, Francis Gus Murray's liberation. 
On May 28th, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Barker, or Baker received a letter from their son, Leo Baker, who had been liberated from Stalag Tubi. He was in France on his way home. The former prisoners shipped out of, from France at Le Havre. Well, it is not clear what, whether they sailed together, Gus Murray reported sailing on the SS Porpoise on June 2nd, 1945, and arriving in New York Harbor on June 13th. Tugboats greeted them and music played that they had not heard before. The Andrews sisters were singing rum and Coca-Cola, but the men did not know the song as it became popular while they were imprisoned. This photo from Angelo Spinelli shows a sign on the shore of New York reading, Welcome home, well done. And that's on the right side there. It's hard to see it though. Um, when Kenneth Gorley arrived back in New York, he remembered what a blessed sight it was to see the Statue of Liberty. I didn't think I'd ever see it again. They received more physical exams, and then the Sturgis men boarded the train for home. The community welcomed them with a variety of celebrations. Gus Murray remembered that on the 4th of July, he and some of the other former prisoners celebrated, but knowing there would be fireworks, they got some beer and food and slipped away into the Black Hills until after the celebrations ended. The Army found limited ways to put the men back to work before the war finally ended a few weeks later. In a twist of fate, Bill Caton found himself guarding German POWs at Fort Meade, just outside of Sturgis. They were sent to Fort Meade to convert it from a military post to a VA hospital and to work on nearby sugar beet fields. Years later, Caton told his family that he enjoyed that duty. Some of the prisoners had been taken in North Africa and fought at Fayed Pass. Knowing German, he visited with them extensively. The German POWs had a far different experience than the Sturgis members of the 109th Engineers. Transportation across America was in a Pullman car. As soldiers in Germany, they had never traveled in anything better than a box car. They had plentiful meals, medical attention, and were paid 80 cents a day for the work they did. The men guarding the Germans had few worries they would try and escape. In many ways, they had it better as American prisoners than as German soldiers. All of the men from Sturgis in the Black Hills area taken prisoner in North Africa returned home alive. One, Bill Weimer, had lost a leg, and another, Butch Barons, would spend a year in Walter Reed Hospital, recovering completely from his kidney problems. They all had been beaten, starved, mistreated, and even almost shot, but the rest suffered no permanent injuries. Following the war, they returned to their lives. Many showed some less visible signs of their experience. Most of them never spoke much about their time in the war or the prison camps. Sharing this with their families may have been too painful. The children of Gus Murray report that he did not speak about his experience, but would occasionally say a few words or tell a brief anecdote that would give them some understanding. They also report he would occasionally stockpile canned goods in his dresser in case he needed them. He told them he would never be hungry like that again. The men would get together a few years for reunions. Some, like Walter Kortz and Tom Bowman, would travel long distances to attend these. And Bev did bring a lot of materials here uh, from a lot of the reunions that her dad would come and attend here in Sturgis. So, you want to take a look at those after we're done? Please do. Fortunately, while most did not share extensive memories with their family, several gave interviews over the years. For brief newspaper stories, oral histories, or school papers, they revealed small memories and stories. While all of these gave interesting glimpses into their individual memories, it is necessary to combine all these stories to gain a more complete picture. When combined with the more extensive memories written by some other men who became prisoners in North Africa and followed the same path, a more complete picture of the experience becomes clear. After surviving a variety of personal, physical, and mental injuries and indignities, it's no wonder they choose not to talk about them. Combining those memories gives loved ones a better idea of what they experienced individually. That experience, made by a group of soldiers who leaned on each other for support and used strong will to survive, becomes even more impressive when it's seen in its entirety. That's it. Thank you very much. I did want to open this up. If anybody had any questions or could correct me on some of my pronunciations. Yes, sir. Brandon. Oh, on this angel, how do you get the pictures out? Do you just have rolls and rolls of film? He, he had them out. He kept them in a bag, but he had it inside a loose coat and everything. Um, 
he was worried. They did a emergent. They did a sudden inspection one day at the camp, and he had all his pictures and his camera with him. And uh, they were the SS were searching everybody. Well, they ended up searching just certain people, and he wasn't one of them. So he panicked for a moment there, but he did keep them all complete. I want to Bill Caton's nieces, and I remember when he was reported missing. I remember, when we finally, I remember then when we finally heard that he was a prisoner of war. I was only about seven years old, so of course kids weren't allowed to hear a lot of things that other people might have. I think my cousin Mabel Lindstrom would agree. And so we didn't really hear a lot, except that I do remember my mother getting the word that her little brother had been, was reported missing in action. And then I remember what a joyful thing it was when they found out that he was alive. He was a prisoner, but he was alive. I remember then when he came home, and I swear he wasn't any bigger around than that. His, arms must have been that, that thin. So, of course, you know, they didn't get much to eat. But anyway, you did a good job, my friend. Are there any other comments or memories anybody wants to share? Anybody else? Oh, over here, Bev. As Mark said, I brought a lot of memorabilia from um, my dad's experience. Um, unfortunately, we found those reunion pictures in the basement after my mom and dad both died, um, and my mom was not good at recording things. Fortunately, she sort of wrote the years on the back, but that's it. So I've told people as I've been catching them, I really would like to know who some of these is, because I grew up hearing the names Sweet Anderson, Bill Caton, Bernie Evleth, Gus Murray, all of those people, because my dad considered them his buddies. Whenever he referred to them, they were his army buddies. And I also remember after I moved out here in 1981, uh, they would have reunions either in Hot Springs or Rapid City or here. And sometimes after work, I'd run down to Rapid City or wherever and catch them after their evening banquet. And one of the things that struck me was, uh, as they would read through the name of those who had died in the previous year, all of those gentlemen would look down and they would almost like kind of touch each other if they were sitting near someone. And there was this real brotherhood and reverence that was very obvious to those gentlemen. So if, you know, if the Murray family or the Anderson family, or if there's people out there that are connected, I would really like to connect because I'd like to see what they have, and um, I would like information. Uh, and um, I've even prompted a couple of people if you'd want to meet me someday here at the library to look at these photos uh, or these reunion pictures and tell me who these people were. I really would like that. And thank you, Mark, for what you put together. Thank you, Bib. And I can't, again, that's how much you helped with your, all the research. Um, she did provide a lot of materials about her own dad, but then she provided a copy, second here, of uh, Walter Court's memories. Now, I gave her back that copy, and I didn't have one, and then one of our board members for the Historical Society, David Super, found this online and just bought it on a whim. But it's a, the same book that I happen to do a, a lot of the research from. Um, there's other research materials here that I used. There's newspaper clippings. I have a whole bin full of stories and articles. Uh, there's books about the war in North Africa and stuff that all were helpful in this process. So I encourage anybody to come over and take a look. Is there anybody else who had anything they wanted to say? Oh, there's one back here. Kenneth Gorley was married to my cousin. Until today, I really didn't have any information on what he went through. So it's been great for me. I can, tell, can I share one tidbit on Ken 
Gorley. My dad shared that Ken Gorley was like the miserly member of the group. He did not gamble. He did not play cards. And what he did is he, he volunteered to do the laundry for all the men, and then they would pay him for doing that. And my dad's pretty sure that Ken Gorley went home with more money than the rest of them. Yep. I got to know him, but he never spoke of anything other. I knew that he was a prisoner of war. Yeah, yeah. I was informed that every Thanksgiving that I was not going to leave anything on my plate that wasn't eaten because Kenneth was there. And yeah. food was very important. To yeah. This little journal my dad had in prison camp, and I've made copies of pages from it in this one notebook I have. But it's all in his handwriting. It's just little pieces of paper of the names and addresses of all the men uh, around him. There's poems in there that I don't know if he wrote. It. And then he drew, uh, there's a diagram of the camp uh, with all the barracks. And uh, this is, and then he wrote whenever he got a letter and from whom. And I, when he talked about the uh, Red Cross b boxes, I had to laugh because my dad said one of the favorite boxes he would get is from a lady in his hometown. And he said, I honestly didn't care what was in the box, but he said what I loved is she always wrapped and packed everything in toilet paper. And he <laughs> said that was the best part of the box. Oh, that's great. It's the small things, you know, that people remember. Is there anybody else who had... Memories or comments? Okay, hold on, I'm coming. What was the size of a of the barrack? If they could have a church in there, a library in there, a rec hall, you know, everything inside of there. I will need to look at my notes to see the exact dimensions, but I do know that they held about 300, 350 people in bunks. So they were fairly substantial in size. I do know I have that information somewhere, but I'll have to let you know, Anita. Thumbs up. Mark, I think somebody's online. Maybe oh, Dave, okay. Dave. I'm coming, Dave. Hold on. Let's see if this will work. Go ahead. What a magical contraption we're using here to uh, tell this story again. And I just, from... My little outpost here in Rapid City, I've got to congratulate you and others who've worked on putting all this together. It is a complicated, uh, emotional, uh, powerful story of what it was like for those citizens of Sturgis, the young men of Sturgis, uh, to be involved in this world war and to become prisoners and to be and to survive, you know, their entire experience um, is just astonishing, I think, and an important part of the history of Sturgis. When the, when the units were called up in 1940 and 41, eventually 100% of the National Guard was mobilized. And there was a popular song that had been written at the same time. And the title of the song, the opening verse of the song was, Goodbye, dear, I'll be back in a year. Because the original mobilization uh, orders were written for one year. Well, we all know that that stretched to five. And uh, it was a long time before those young men from Sturgis, uh, with a lifetime of experience, squeezed into about three and a half years, uh, came home and, and uh, emblematic as an old guardsman I get pretty uh, uh, emotional about all of this and the like and and realize the sacrifices that hometown men and now women make in order to serve thank you David that was really thoughtful I do know that you know a lot of the more modern members of the 109th that came after this group um, had pure reverence for all these gentlemen and what they went through. Um, we have several members of the 109th here, and uh, I know that they had <clears throat> memories of, of visiting with these, with these folks about things. Are there any other comments or questions? 
All right. 